Hello, fabulous friends, fans, and superstars. Welcome to Synchronicity Web TV. I am your astrologer and your host, Nadia Shaw, and this is your moment of synchronicity. Well, I'm just so excited right now. Uh, I am going to be talking to, hanging out with one of my very dear friends, and I don't say that lightly. Michael Barwick has been a little Jupiter in my life. I have known him for many years. If you've ever reached out to me for a reading and you've been like, I need a reading right now and I need it in person and I'm not able to do it, he is the first person that I will refer you to. If you reach out to me and you ask for a rectification, so for example, you want to pinpoint the time of birth, get the chart really accurate, he's the astrologer that I refer you to because he just is that good. And his website is megaspare.com. He has horoscopes there. But at least for today, and at least for now, we're going to hang out and we're just going to see where it goes and we're going to talk about everything. So, Michael, thank you for being here. Welcome, my dear. It's my pleasure, Nadia. Always a pleasure to interact with you and participate in this thing we love, astrology, together. Yes, we do love it so much. And I'm sorry, I feel so corny, like I'm going to ask you some very base questions just so people can get to know you, even though I know the answers to these, so it's a little weird. But let me just ask you, what got you into astrology? Why do you love astrology? Just just start there. Well, I, I started for me very young. I, my parents moved into sort of rural eastern Ontario back in the 70s, and there really wasn't much but a uh, beautiful star lit nights and uh, my parents' book collection. My mother was into sort of a lot of the new consciousness things that were coming up in the early 70s. So the I Ching, astrology, tarot. I can remember I'd stay at home. When I was at home sick, I'd play solitaire with tarot cards, which is sort of an outrageous thing to do when I think about it now. But that was just sort of, I had exposure to these kind of occult tools. But it was astrology that most fascinated me because it explained how people were similar and yet utterly distinct. And, uh, you know, I found looking at my friends, uh, my classmates' horoscopes that, uh, that helped me to understand why they were the way they were. And I got so into it that um, my parents used to wheel me out at parties and I'd interpret the charts of adults, much to uh, the consternation and laughter of those in attendance with what outrageous predictions I would make. Uh, I guess it was You were a child uh, doing this. Uh, uh, like you were like nine, I think you told me once. Well, no, I wasn't. I was 11 when I did this. Oh, when I, so I would, <laughs> so I would hold, very precocious, right? I would hold this audience of adults mesmerized by what I could do with astrology. So it, it was an interest that, you know, kept with me all through high school but then it was sort of in my 20s. I went through sort of a very difficult time and astrology sort of reached out to me. And uh, before I knew what I was doing, I was reading vast numbers of books. I was um, involved in the local organization. I was learning from local astrologers. And uh, eventually somebody said, hey, I'm going to pay you for this reading. Because I was just doing readings just to do readings as one does when one begins. You want to look at as many charts as you can and be able to ask questions in a sort of safe way. So I was doing those kinds of readings with people. But you're doing more and more. People hear that you're doing them and then they go, gee, I'd like you to look at my chart. So somebody finally paid me and I realized, aha, this is the way I can pay for my books, my conferences. My, and later on, my software and, you know, all the things, all the investment that one does in the field when one goes into it. And I completely relate to that. That really is it. At first, it's like, hey, I'll do this for you if you look at my chart. And then it's like, I'll pay you 10 bucks if you look at my chart. And then some light goes <laughs> off, right? Like, that's how it was for me. It was like, oh, this could be something. Yeah, it's like the universe sending you a very, I think, a very clear sign. And given how good you are at it, it's very obvious that this is a part of what you're meant to do, that's for sure. And I know that you are quite the nerd, just like me. You know, both of us, we love philosophy and we love history, yeah. we love reading all of that stuff. So who would you say historically is an astrologer that you really like, like you like their ideas? Who would you say? Well, I think, you know, when you look at um, you look at the early work of, say, Ptolemy in terms of his his dedication to working out the mathematics. He's really more of an astronomer than an astrologer. But nevertheless, he compiled 
all the sort of, you know, uh, you know, thinking about astrology that had existed 2000 years ago, you know, in Egypt in terms of the synthesis that emerged that produced Western astrology, which came out of in part Egypt, in part Babylon, and in part, well, largely Hellenistic or Greek, ancient Greece, uh, contributed to the development of the, the, the discipline that we understand today. Um, there are uh, there is Lily. I have uh, you know some respect for in terms of his his um, his work. Um, although he tends to kind of you can see sort of the craftsman in him that kind of makes things up as he goes along, which is to a certain extent something of what astrology is. We find how things fit together into a whole, and it isn't always as systematic as we would like it to be. Astrologers like to think of themselves as very intellectual things, but within the discipline of itself, what happens is magical, uh, sort of outside of just the manipulation of ideas in the head, which is what a lot of astrology or a lot of astrology goes on, traditionally ruled by Mercury. Yeah, it reminds me of, um, you know, my former professor, Jeffrey Cornelius. I know that you have a connection to him. You took a workshop with him and all of that. And so you yes. know special how brilliant he is. But yes. his book, The Moment of Astrology, is, is all about this. It's the exploration of what happens in that moment when we're actually doing, practicing astrology <laughs> itself. Not just learning, not just cookbooks, not just getting ideas here and there. But when we're in the moment, there has been historically... Uh, an understanding that that is a magical moment, a moment of, in, of interpretation, a moment of poetry, a moment of inspiration, however you want to understand it, magic is playing out there. Well, I think it's also, I think for many people, it's also, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a confrontation with fate. Um, you know, maybe less so now, maybe people are more sophisticated in terms of understanding that astrology at its root is really more, archetypally predictive than concretely predictive. If it was concretely predictive, we'd all be millionaires, but it's not, it's archetypally predictive, which leaves a lot of room in terms of how something can manifest in a person's life. Uh, but it I also think, gives us a lot of control. Like I think more than sometimes we realize, like you said, if it's archetypally predictive and you, you know you're having a big transit that's coming up, you're able to say, okay, yes, it could manifest in all these different ways. And so I'm going to approach it from that deeper archo archetypal psychological perspective. You know, I'm going to focus yeah. on the psychology. Right. That can help a lot. Like that is a way to really not only uh, negate the energy, I found anyways, that you're able to calm the energy down in some way if you get more to the root, the archetypal root, if you will. Well, as Nick Campionis pointed out, that throughout history, as much as people sort of in the traditional school like to say this isn't the case, it's always been the case that people have come to astrologers and they've been told you've got X, Y, and Z happening. And, you know, but if you do certain things, certain propitiations to the gods, certain purification rituals, certain lifestyle changes, certain, you know, attitudinal changes. Yeah, prayers, yeah. Right, exactly, that you can change how you're oriented to the nature of whatever it is, the predictive factor that you're so scared of. Um, I mean, sometimes it's gotten, you know, goes to ridiculous heights, like when a particular pope was terrified that, that there was going to be, uh, there was going to be a, a solar eclipse. So he did all kinds of things to sort of cancel out the solar eclipse in the Vatican, um, you know, which is sort of, you know, the idea of sort of, of, which is sort of contrary to the way I sort of see how we want to work with the cosmos as it is and do things with it as it is creatively. Uh, making choices that uh, allow us to maintain our agency, our free will, to be able to use astrology, use what I like to say the celestial navigation aspect of it, to steer our lives in the direction that we want to go, right? It's like you're having this kind of influence, it means you can do these kinds of things, so maybe you want to focus it you know, towards whatever dream it is that you're trying to build, whatever it is that you're trying to achieve in your life, you can use that time productively towards a particular end that serves your greater goal. 
Okay, so Michael, what do you think? Should we jump into prediction and looking at current events and what's going on? How do you feel about it? Do you feel ready? We can, sure, we can talk about it. I mean, certainly, given the fact that we're all sort of consumed by the events in the collective, the pandemic that is raging around us and to one degree or another has shut things down, um, and now people are thinking that they can open up things again and let's see where this leads. Uh, the trouble is no one really knows for sure how it's going to work out. Um, but we do know that Mars is like, as we're recording this, Mars is stepping into the sign of Pisces and Mars is going yeah. to activate Mercury and all of this, this sense of how this pandemic just took over the world became this, you know, unseen but pervasive force that just changed everything so quickly. All of that happened under uh, the Mercury retrograde season, the larger Mercury retrograde season, Mercury in yeah. the shadow and then retrograde and then direct in the sign of Pisces. And so now it's going to be Mars that's activating all of, of that. Right. Path. Yeah, I I think I think a virus that's a lung specialist, you know, you, you don't want squares between Pisces and Gemini going on in the sky for long periods of time when something like that is in motion. I mean, the, so the the I was talking to a friend um, today about you know the infinite square of Venus to Neptune and the yearning and the longing and the pining. And this nostalgia, I mean, that'll be the Mercury retrograde piece of it, the nostalgia. If we could go back to summer as it was before, can you remember going to the pool and going to the beach and going to the cottage and all this sort of, you know, summer is long past, uh, you know, endless retrogrades to sort of dredge up what was and cannot be under, under these conditions. I think a lot of people are going to be tempted to to break their social bubbles. I don't think it's over. Uh, I mean, you know, I'm I don't know the science. I mean, I'm, I'm not an epide epidemiologist. I'm not Fauci. I can't say, you know, uh, and but he he would be the first to say no one knows. All I know is the astrology. I can't see things changing until Jupiter Pluto is over, mm -hmm. and that's not until the end of the year. Um, and my hope is, my hope is that. The Jupiter Saturn conjunction in Aquarius at zero degrees Aquarius. I know every every time every time you're dealing with an astrological audience and the word Aquarius is said, it's a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> no, right? You imagine people dancing in a circle <laughs> and all will be as one and <laughs> extremely harmonious. <laughs> but God, I mean, Aquarius has a very strong dichotomy. <laughs> yeah. Dichotomy. Well, you know what? We've had this out with Aquarius. Yeah. We've had this out with like with Aquarius. I think Aquarius is very Saturnian, um, much more Saturnian than it's prepared to admit. Similarly, with the Scorpio, the Scorpios of the world who think that they're so Plutonian because it's so intense. But the reality is, is that a lot. I see a lot of Mars there, mm -hmm. and if you know, I live with a Pisces, and believe me, they're just as judgmental as any Sagittarian could be. Um, they just hide it better. Yeah. Yeah, Jupiter rulership. Yeah. Of course, you have to take the the traditional rulers as co-rulers, but you know, I I like to think because I am an Aquarius son, I like to think of myself as a Uranian Aquarian. But you know, <laughs> something. Yeah, well, you've something about Aquarius being Uranus. I mean, I just <clears throat> more. What is it? Maybe it's ego. But I it's flattery. <laughs> I want to be part of that new age, that next wave. That yeah, do you want to be? Uranus is ruthless and doesn't care. It uh, doesn't care about so many aspects of you know mere human nature and human connection and human relatedness. I mean, Uranus is the big shatterer. It comes along, and people suddenly throw over marriages and throw over relationships and. And break up, and you know, new people come into their lives, and that profoundly change them. And Uranus transit is is a shattering experience for many. It depends on the temperament of the person, of course, but it can be exciting. It can be about breakthrough. It can be about seeing a bigger picture. It can be about illumination for sure. Um, 
it's all those lovely things. But for more watery types, uh, you know, Uranus is like shattering. It breaks relationships. It doesn't. They don't like that. Mm. Um, you know, so much of what of our responses to planetary energies in our charts are based in our charts. Uh, you know, the idea of the root, the root prediction is in the horoscope itself, the natal chart, potentiality is always there, and it's just waiting for the right trigger to set it off. And then there it is. Um, I have a friend who has a Venus Uranus, uh, well, friend and client who has a Venus Uranus conjunction. And you know, um, she said she had this experience and she thought it was very Iranian. So she called me and I was looking at her chart. And sure enough, there were some Iranian indicators. But if you look at her chart natally, she has Venus conjunct Uranus. So the idea of sort of a relationship sort of shattering and it being significant for that person is a theme that she's going to have to contend with, you know, that, that you know, um, uh, in her life and, and the impact that it's going to have. Because it's a, you know it's in water and, and so on and so forth. The specifics aren't important, but the idea is that 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 the way the planets um, coincide with what's going on with us is that that we have them somewhere in our horoscopes, and they're like little tuning forks that start resonating to whatever influences is on the horizon. And uh, you know, it's not that the planets cause anything to happen. It's it's not that crude. It's they just reflect what's happening already in progress. And so you think that basically transits wake up what's already within you? Oh, I, it's it's yeah. And so th this is why uh, you know you get it, you know your mileage may vary in terms of how you know, a transit impacts you. I mean, certainly some of the traditional astrologers get into this in terms of, you know, which malefic really has it in for you based on whether you're bored day or night and so forth. Um, the idea of who's the villain. I don't know if it's totally works. I'd have to think about it, but, but, uh, and research it more, but, but this idea that we, you know, we don't respond the same way to the same set of transits or the same set of predictive factors, whatever you're looking at, no two human beings react the same way because no two human beings have exactly the same horoscope and the nature of their horoscopes have a, have a direct impact in terms of how they contend with whatever, whatever archetypal essence they're being, um, they're being presented. Well, it's also Ptolemy that said um, in Tetrabiblos, in the introduction to it, he talks about in the first book, he talks about how that the stars have influence, right? Now, we in our modern times, we can debate that word and that understanding of influence. But he also says that the family you're born into, the culture that you're born into, also have an influence in your life. So right from the beginning, he's saying that it's not just about what's happening astrologically, but there's also this sense of uh, the context in which you are living, the context in which you are born, that is also going to shape you in some way and shape the opportunities available to you and how you're able to use those transits. Yeah, this gets into sort of the astrology of the astrology of the seed packet. If you've ever bought seeds, it's like you get a seed, you buy a package of seeds, and on the package of the seeds, it's like you have a picture of what the seed is supposed to look like if it's grown, put in the ground and planted, and it's given optimal conditions to grow. That picture is sort of what a horoscope is. Mm -hmm. Given given, you know, this is the totality of what this person has in, in terms of potential to develop. If all of this under optimal conditions, if they're allowed to, if they're given, you know, if they're given those kinds of, um, you know, if they're given those the right kinds of opportunities, the right water, the right soil, all of that. If all right, that, right, right. Then it's you're going to get a healthier person. I think there's also some truth to the idea that souls incarnate at different levels of consciousness or different levels of awareness, or maybe they just learn faster. Well, older souls learn faster how to, how to, um, Leo. yeah, yeah, you know, be able to 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 do better with 
with circumstances in their chart. I mean, others sort of say that what you, the chart you get is sort of what you deserve karmically. I, I sort of reject that, but, but there are some who believe that if you've got nothing but trines, you were a good person in a past life. Oh, no. <laughs> trines make you lazy. Actually, many, many years ago, when I first started really getting into charts, back then, you know, this is before the internet, I remember having, I mean, of course there was the internet, but it wasn't like a, a presence like it is now. Mm -hmm. We were talking in the 90s and I would have to go to the New Age bookstore. There was a store called Omega uh, in Toronto, in downtown Toronto, maybe you remember. Yes. Because it was this yep. huge New Age store. It was like sort of the center that you always went to. And you would have to like order the charts you wanted to see basically, or they'd have mm -hmm. a like a stack available, you could look them up. And I remember looking up the charts of famous people, expecting to see grand trines all over the place, shocked oh to see squares, right? See all these yeah. squares, like uh, Oprah, Sun Square Mars. I think that Madonna has that as well, Sun Square Mars. So you see these- Doesn't surprise me. Yeah, and they've manifested it or they use it very differently, but it has allowed them to tap into a well of power and determination to to be all it is that they are meant to be, that they hope to be. And I actually saw an interview of Oprah with Paulo Coelho, who wrote The Alchemist. And in this interview, she was saying that she has this fear that there's something that she's meant to do in this lifetime and that she's not going to get it done. And that propels her to work harder and harder. And I thought to myself, oh, my God, Oprah's thinking this? like. Come on. Like, but then you think, okay, maybe that's made her, you know, more determined, ambitious, harder working. All of that comes as a result of that feeling. Uh, even though we on the outside would look and, and see the impact of her life and think, what? What are you thinking? But those squares, they can really they motivate you. They've got great things going for them, but then they also can make it very hard to be at peace, right? Well, it's highly energizing. Yeah. They're very highly energizing, and and the first, you know, just the frustration alone makes you want to move uh, with a square. You've got to do something. You can't sit on it. No one can sit on a square. It's it's not possible. Trines, you can just lay out the hammock and stay there forever if you want, but not a square. It's a different different animal. Okay, so let me ask you, because we've talked about the pandemic and how you see it playing out throughout this year. Yeah. I actually think, I mean, I know you have a little bit of a different opinion. I'm incredibly hopeful about Jupiter connect Saturn, the great conjunction at the end of the year uh, at zero degrees of Aquarius. I am uh, so hopeful for that in a whole bunch of ways. So one is that that to me is a, a whole new way of sharing information that might not have even been invented yet. Because the last time we had that was 600 years ago, the very seed, speaking of seeds, the very beginning of the printing press happened. Yeah. And, um, you know, this could be our way of sharing information going completely paperless, as Rick Levine said. It's like going completely digital, but in a new way, like a digital that we yeah. have before. And then I also think of this as, um, you know, rationality, right? which can be a good thing too. But Aquarius also being connected to astrology as well, at least the way I see it. I know you see uh, astrology more of a Gemini thing. And I think- that No, no, no. No? No, I think it's more- I think it's more Sagittarian, but anyway, go on. Really? But isn't it the way that you practice astrology? Isn't it your approach to astrology that determines whether it's an Aquarian endeavor, a Sagittarian? Because some people are very Virgo with their astrology, wouldn't you say? Well, oh, yes, but look at it this way. What is the most popular word that astrologers use? What, tell, can you tell me what the most popular word that astrologers use? Uh, possibly? No. What? Interesting. Interesting. Yes, that's so true. That's interesting, isn't it? <laughs> that's interesting. Oh, you mean Pluto, da 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 da, Uranus, blah blah blah, Mars, X, you know, Neptune, you know, and so forth. You know, this long uh, train of sim symbols, or it can be much more simple. You know, I had a really Virgo day, and it's like, oh yeah, I totally relate. You know, or whatever. There are, you know, there are ways of, again, conveying 
the language is very powerful sort of for conveying, um, you know, the quality of, of a particular state or thing or event and the signs are best understood. So in terms of local, locally finding astrology in the signs, I'm not so sure, but I think it's very much a ninth house. Divination is ninth, traditionally ninth house. Mm. And astrology itself is mercurial. It's it's very much in the head, connecting things and disconnecting things. And it's when those little gray cells start firing when somebody has suggested, oh, this happened up here and that happened down here. And the response is, oh, that's interesting. There's no question which planet is engaged. It's Mercury. Mm. Okay, so let me ask you about the Great Conjunction. What are your thoughts on that? What do you think um, that's going to speak to for us as a collective? Well, I think, I mean, you know, the, this has been put, it's out there already, but I mean, it, it's, it's, it's nothing new. The Jupiter-Saturn the Jupiter Saturn cycle is very much with, uh, involved with the king is dead, long live the king. So it's, it reflects a new order sweeping into the world. Um, Every 20 years. Every twenty years, and for a long, t for a long time, and it's supposedly the marker of generations, the marker of the business cycle, and then of course there's this whole thing about that it moves from one element to another, and we happen to be fortunately born at a time when, um, when we're seeing the mutation from Earth to air. So, so uh, if you go back far enough with these, it's it was in Earth forever. I mean, I. I you know, I, I can't recall exactly when it started its cycle on Earth, but it was in Earth long enough. Years ago, yeah. Yeah. We had it was a little in, bit of a dip in, in Libra in 1980, but other than that, it's been a whole lot of right. Earth for 200 years. And we'll talk about we'll talk about the mutation in, in, in 80 in a minute. But the the in every case of the conjunctions happening in Earth meant, you know, they're every 20 years. So every 20 years there is a, you know, when there was an election of a U.S. president under the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction, that person ultimately dies in office, which I think is a very interesting coincidence. Wow. And it was, it was kept that way all the way up to Reagan, who was shot, mm. but did not die. In 1980, and, right? In 1980. In 1981, the Pope was shot but did not die. Again, the idea that there were attempts on the king, that in fact the king survived, you know, maybe because Libra's an air sign, maybe because Libra's more abstract. So in 2000, George W. Bush was elected. He lived, he did not die in office, but his, his period in office was marked by 9-11, which had a profound effect in terms of changing the dynamics of global politics and the United States and the building of Homeland Security and the effect on, you know, these centennials who are coming up who are, who have always been involved in the war on terror, right? Post, you know, 9-11. Um, so this time around, we're having it in 2020, we're having it in Aquarius. It's hard for me to see how um, uh, the old ways are going to be able to stand up to this. Mm -hmm. And I see sort of the hopefulness of it in that respect, in that Aquarius is progressive, I mean, ideally. That is what it, it seeks to do, is to build things that will last for the future, right? You know, in terms of involved, in terms of long-term thinking about the future, of having that sense of the, the, where we ultimately are going. I mean, all the fixed signs to some degree or another have some sense of the future, but Aquarius is best equipped to verbally articulate it in a way that can be objectively understood. Whereas in Leo, it is sort of, it is sort of, you know, intuited. In Scorpio, it is felt. In Taurus, it is sensed. But um, uh, where in Aquarius, we get this very conscious orientation towards articulating what the future is going to be and where we want it to be. And so I think that given what we've been going through with all this Capricorn stuff, um, you know, and, and the conjunctions of the malefics earlier in the year, Mars, Saturn, and so forth, um, when things were exploding, the pandemic was blowing up and restrictions were being added and things were being locked down, um, I think that that conjunction is a very hopeful indicator 
of, you know, a breath of fresh air uh, in terms of where we're going next. But again, you know, I don't know the science. I mean, I, it, it certainly looks that way. I mean, it's a, it's, um, you know, they say that Christ was born under a Jupiter, uh, Jupiter Saturn conjunction, and here it is, yeah, uh, in Pisces, and here it is happening in Aquarius. So, so um, that interesting, yeah. Just on the dawn of the age of Aquarius, we have this the uh, dawn on the age of Aquarius. Yes, Aquarius is the magic sign. Everyone goes perks up when they hear Aquarius. So yeah. it's but the fact Christ it, was born under that conjunction at the dawn of the age of Pisces. Right, at the dawn of Age of Pisces, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's very powerful to to consider. And I was also thinking about how there's, um, with Aquarius, it is at once about the collective, but also very individual. It's yeah. at once about gathering and getting together, but it's also about being connected on the web. And so it will be very interesting to see the new ways with which we find to connect. But I also feel like there's going to be this, by the time that conjunction comes, a lot of us are going to be ready to meet each other, is what I see. The, the, the conjunctions of Jupiter and Pluto will be behind us, and it will be at this conjunction that not only are we going to be ready to meet each other, but I also see this as fundamentally changing um, how we work, for example. It, it, yeah, I was thinking the other day that, you know, I, I called American Express for something and I was talking to them and I was saying, you know, thank you for your work and stuff like that. And they were the girl was telling me or the woman was telling me that everybody's working from home now. And I thought that was so interesting because I remember my aunt not that long ago, 10 years ago, having to go to a call center to work for American Express. Now right. jobs have been moved to home. How likely is it going to be that these corporations are going to be like, yeah, come back to the call center now that they've set up this infrastructure to have people work at home. And when you work at home, you have to be a special kind of person, you know, to be the kind of person who's okay with that space because it can yeah. be isolating. You really have to be okay with being on your own. And I think that a part of work is the social aspect. And so if you don't oh, yeah. with work, then you're that much more likely to seek it out, to be ready to connect with other people. Uh, and so, yes, I think at, at once we're going to be ready to connect, but at the same time, there's this sense of how that is going to uh, become part of the structure, the sense of distance and yet connected, becoming more part of the structure, more part of the work that we do, the careers that we choose. Well, I think I think it's it's also going to be you know the the call for change, right? Like the call for for you know the old way. Yeah. Going back to the old way is not. We got to go to the new way, whatever the new way is. And it's not you know it's it's not you can't pour new wine into old wineskins. It's it's a it's a new thing that's being created. It's a new cycle. It's kicking off the cycle in air. We're going to have conjunctions in air going forward, which says something about cycles upon cycles upon cycles of intellectual communication, relational, um, verbal, reasonable, logical, scientific to some degree is air. You know these kinds of these kinds of areas, these kinds of concerns are going to drive a lot of what we what what we do for the next you know for two the foreseeable centuries. future yeah. for the next two because centuries right the next two centuries yeah. right yeah definitely the last time i looked at it was like well it's my lifetime that's for sure so you know the the transition from earth to air is is a significant mutation a less concrete more abstract um, cooler uh, more about theory more about communication connection it networking you know, all those kinds of, all the Aquarian buzzwords. Well, I think, you know, bottom line, we're looking at symbols that are manifesting um, in a profound way um, in that they provide us with opportunities with raw material. And I would like to think that the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction Aquarius would be about the kind of idealistic things I know the sign is capable of. Um, you know, the fellowship uh, of, you know, all humanity, the reaching out, the, 
the connectivity and not some kind of an elitist, you know, only the 1% or, you know, 5% or 10%, you know, who have a high speed internet connection are going to be able to, to get through things, you know. I also would like to see something more about the Aquarian age being less about whether you have your parking deck all and can have the authority to park in the parking lot and more about sort of, you know, the mystic crystal revelations that were talked about in the song, you know, in terms of a, a science that understands something a little bit beyond, beyond itself and either, you know, discovers things that are helpful to those of us who are in other fields or is um, perhaps, you know, respectful of its role in the world and understanding that there are other paradigms, other ways of looking at things. And the astrological paradigm is just another way of looking at things. And so I do think that in 2021, we're going to have this series of squares between Saturn and Uranus. And I feel like this is um, us as humanity working out what is this Aquarian age going to mean for us and all the different desires and the different pulls and the resistance to it as well. How do you see that square between Saturn in Aquarius and Uranus in Taurus? How do you interpret that? Well, it's already in play. I mean, certainly the, the, the groups of people who are descending on state houses demanding their liberty, or even in Toronto, the protesters that are protesting the fact that they've been locked down because of public health concerns, this is very much Saturn Uranus. Saturn in Aquarius saying, you know, this is, this is the way it's gotta be because these are the rules and we have the expertise and we're the scientists and we know and you don't. And so therefore to protect you and everyone around you, these are the rules that are coming down. And it's not, as I said earlier, it's from the experts and not from the politicians who are sort of directing how things are evolving. So that's the Saturn side of it. The Uranian side of it is Uranus and Taurus is, I don't care what you say. I just want to do what feels good because I want to do what feels good because that's what I want to do. And this is an inconvenience to my pleasure. And so I'm out there protesting. And so this is the, this is, even though it's not exact yet, we're seeing sort of the, the struggle between the institutional might versus sort of this subversive, um, you know, Aquarian, you know, rabble rousing energy around, you know, my stuff, my personal liberty, my fun, my pleasure, what's worth it to me. And some protester, I think, held a sign that said, um, um, your health ends where my liberty begins, right? So, which I thought was like just the ultimate Uranian statement, you know, that there, you don't have any boundaries because, you know, because of this, because of me, my Uranian need to do my own thing, regardless of the consequences and regardless of the chaos that unfolds because of it. Mm. That's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is that, you know, there are people who are desperately trying to reform the system and pull things towards doing something different and have been up previous to this point, previous to COVID. Like if we look at the world, previous to COVID, it didn't change, COVID didn't change the transits. I mean, we were still under the gun because of the climate stuff that we're doing. We're still, you know, running over capacity. Everybody knows that we're, we're, it's not sustainable in its current, its current form. This is not a secret. I mean, people deny it and so forth, but it's it's well known by any educated person or anyone who runs any numbers around it that this is not sustainable what we're doing. To the um, environment, you mean, right? To the environment, to to and 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 yeah, to the environment, but also, you know, what we do to our fellow creatures, like, you know, in terms of of animals, Farming, yeah. animals, how we're treating animals and how, you know, um, which are, uh, you know, uh, hot spots for problems all over the world. Um, including in North America. Including, including North America. Factory farming and how um, animals are given so much medication so that they can live in these, you know, really, really not good, for lack of a better way of putting it, conditions 
and that makes us immune, like to yes. actually having antibiotics. That weakens our immunity ultimately as well. So right. We are not able to handle a virus like this as much because we're eating factory farmed meat. And a lot of people aren't making that connection. And, uh, you know, it's been very heartbreaking to me to see people pointing fingers at wet markets. And wet markets are basically in throughout the world, really. It's what we call farmers markets here. So, what we call farmers markets in Canada and in the US, that's what wet markets are throughout Asia, yeah. uh, throughout the Middle East, throughout Africa. And they're saying, oh, you're doing something wrong instead of us looking in the mirror and looking at what we're doing, because it, it really is that we are. And, you know, when you said we can't keep going like this, it's it's hard for me because I, I acknowledge and I recognize that people are suffering in Canada. OK, it is about the pleasure because thankfully, you know, Canada has some very strong social systems in place. So people are OK, you know, at this time, right. not as prosperous or as well that they as they would like to be or as they were before. But you're going to be okay. You're going to survive uh, with all the different uh, benefits that are in place in Canada. At least in the U.S., you can have more compassion because really the benefits are so minimal that there are people who financially are, are suffering that much more. And it, I'm in Mexico. Like when they said everybody stay home, there's no pay. Like people are not getting any no. kind of, you know. And so yeah. it is very um, heartbreaking to see that suffering taking place and yet there's also this sense of how can we emerge better how can we do things differently and do things better so that we're not in this place again and it does feel sometimes like you know when you don't see the forest for the trees like being so focused on my liberty my freedom my this and i understand that goodness i have some very strong uranus energy in my chart you better believe it but at the same time, it's like, wait a minute, how can we ensure, how can we be part of a larger solution so that we're not in this place again? And all the layers with which we can understand that. So it's tough, you know, it's, a, it's a tough. But I just think with that square coming up, there's going to be resistance. I just see a lot of resistance to that. Well, there will, I, I think, and that's, you know, that's, that's what I see with the emerging new, I mean, that, that, that emerging new order of, you know, is going to face Uranian resistance of, you know, of the chaos of, of struggle of people that struggle against it, who, who want to do their own thing, who want to run the world their own way, who don't recognize that there's a public good. Mm -hmm. I, I, think, underst I understand, I understand that the impact is falling unfairly, and I will point that out, underline, bold, and italicize it, unfairly on the poor and the marginalized. Who are the people that are dying? It's the old people in the old age homes who are paying what they're paying, but, but they're relatively less expensive facilities than the kinds of, you know, the kinds of care that would be ideal for that population. Um, so it's the old, it's the poor, it's the sick. And then, you know, then of course, there's the whole racial issues that are, you know, exposed in the United States in terms of people of color having more trouble with the disease than, than not, and men having more trouble with the disease than women. And a lot of that is rooted in, um, like, exactly what you were saying in terms of the fact that there are certain um, like income locations, right? Income brackets and who is doing those jobs and how much they're being exposed that much more. So there's that, um, that layer as well. Oh yeah. And I, I think, I think it's, you know, um, I think we'll see change. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm confident. I mean, it's part of the hope that I pin on that Jupiter Saturn conjunction in Aquarius is that, you know, reform, there will be reform because of this thing, the world will change because of this it will not be the same because of this, you know, it's, it's, um, uh, 
you know, and maybe out of it, something good will come down the road. But in the meantime, it's a lot of blood, sweat and tears and deaths. And, and to say that it's somehow just the flu or that it's somehow a hoax. I mean, we have people who are having, who get this and require uh, a heart transplant who require dialysis as part of their treatment in hospital. Can you imagine? Like, it's like on top of everything else, you need to have a heart transplant because it's attacking the heart or other, or it's attacking the liver um, or it's hiding out here, there and everywhere. I do, I, it's, 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 um, I understand that over the summer, I understand that people are tired and I understand that the yearning, the pining and the longing for real connection of a tangible kind is going to be painful uh, over the summer for many. Um, it's uh, the key is, I think, you know, I think is to find, you've got to find hobbies and diversions and artistic things to put your energy into, whether they're good or not, just to occupy your time. It's, it's, it's part of what I think Venus, Mercury are uh, good at together. Um, so that's what I encouraged my readers to do when I wrote my horoscopes about it. And I also think that the Saturn Uranus square, in a way, it's the resistance to that Aquarian energy that you're talking about. Right. I was going to start moving into Aquarius in 2023 and 2024. That's a 20 year transit. Regardless of whether people resist it or not, we are going to be in it. <laughs> like, we are going to be right. diving in. We are going to fully be in that Aquarian age uh, once Pluto moves. Well, Saturn is Saturn goes first, and it's like get your act together because Pluto's coming. Right? That's the you know it's it's coming out of the conjunction. Jupiter coming out of the conjunction. It's like get your Aquarian stuff together because you know things are gonna things are gonna change. Um, things are gonna move. Things are going to happen. I, I guess, uh, I guess it's, it's, um, yeah. I mean, this idea, my dear, that Uranus rules astrology is to me very strange, given that when it was discovered, it practically coincides with astrology being thrown out of the universities. That's because interesting. It was, That's very interesting. Yeah. There's that word. Interesting. There you go. <laughs> I proved it. Yeah. <laughs> It got thrown out of the universities because the sphere, the celestial sphere of fixed stars got, you know, hurtled out into the cosmos and that, you know, we had this other planet to work with. Um, that did it, you know, and, and that it plus... The definition of science, right? Your are yeah. it's discovered and what we understood when we said the word science meant something very different before the discovery of Uranus. Then Uranus gets discovered, it's the Cartesian split uh, you know, yep. the, the divorce of spirit and matter. And it's the yep. empirical study of matter that ends up being the age of enlightenment that ends up being the discovery yep. of Uranus. So why do I like having Uranus as the, as connected to astrology so much? What do you think? That well, I think, I think, uh, you know, it's the, the outer planets are very sexy. They have a lot of glamour. Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, come on. I mean, we all talk about how terrified we are of them, but but really it's, you know, read some of the beginner books and you'll see, oh, there's a few pages on Mercury, but then there's like 10 pages on Uranus. Yeah. You know, even though Mercury has way more to do with what our getting around the planet is. I've gotten kind of, well, you know my work, I tend to sort of, I've harvested a lot of, traditional techniques and use them psychologically. That's sort of what I do. Because again, it goes back to my original quest to sort of understand why people were the way they were and found, you know, I found material in, you know, traditional astrology that was helpful in terms of helping me sort of ascertain, well, in a horoscope, for example, which planet where, you know, wins the beauty contest and so forth. Really? Yeah, the Aquarian age, Pluto, Pluto and Aquarius brings an opportunity to reform what Aquarius has been up to this point for our culture. We haven't had a conscious transit of Pluto through Aquarius before because Pluto was only discovered in 1930. So it'll be very interesting. Some people are predicting kind of, you know, you know, scientific um, 
scientific uh, uh, dogmatism, you know, ascending under this. Mm. Um, I think it's more likely that the sort of the shadow side of science and the shadow side of this intellectual thing is what we're going to see because that's what Pluto does. Pluto makes us confront, you know, why aren't we living like brothers and sisters? You know, why aren't we, you know, one great group working towards the betterment of all humanity? Why aren't we thinking about the future? You know, and I mean more than just the next quarter and whether we're going to get our stock up or not. Um, these are the kinds of questions that Pluto and Aquarius is going to present, you know, and not just in a sort of theoretical, abstract, intellectual way, but in a very passionate and a very sort of necessity-driven kind of way to force us to sort of relook at all of these things. Pluto in a sign is is turbulence in that sign, for sure. Well, any of the outer planets are, um, are turbulence. There's still such huge change that is set to take place for the United States in, in 2021. Yeah. No matter who the president is, it is a huge uh, 2021, 2022. So much is changing for the United States. They're having their Pluto return. They're having Saturn on their south node and then Saturn on their moon. They're going to have Uranus squaring their south node. And all of this does say that, I mean, look, the U.S. is in for a profound change and profound transformation. I think, I think Nadia, the future is now. We're already there. We're already there. Like we're already, things are such a mess. The fact that we're committing ecocide as a species, is that not a mess? I mean, if that's not a mess, if that's not a violation of everything that Capricorn stands for, which is ultimately the preservation of the structures that support life, like this to me is the fundamental issue, is that, 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 that you know, it's a question of us taking responsibility and then building appropriately, you know, for what the, for future generations. And if we can't do that with these Capricorn Aquarius alignments, when are we going to do it? Yeah, it is a, a time of, of profound change without a doubt. And it would probably be a good idea if more of us embraced it, went with the flow. I, I have been calling this time the great pause. Yeah, me too. We are being asked to pause, to just stop for a minute. And it is there that we're finding so much within us. And for some people, it's a time of peace. But I think for a lot of people, they're finding anger and fear and resentment and all of that. And so it's just people showing us what's really inside of them at a time like this, at a heightened time where we're all paused in some way or another. And that is um, the ability to adjust focus even just a little bit to contemplate what really is going on with what's being triggered within us just a little bit. I think it just gives us that much more power. That's the thing we want to, I mean, the reason we do astrology and, and I mean, I can say this about you because I known you well enough. The reason we do astrology is because we believe in human agency, mm -hmm. right? We believe in the power of choice. We believe in the power of being able to move in the direction towards your dreams. That's what we believe in. And we believe that astrology is a tool that can help you do that. That's what, you know, like many tools, there are many tools. I'm not saying that there aren't, it's the only tool, many tools. But astrology is very, very helpful because it provides a timing system unlike any other in terms of understanding. At the very least, if something horrible is happening to you, when it's going to be over. When we look at what's happening, I think, you know, the last of the Jupiter, the last of the Jupiter-Pluto conjunctions are the last of what Capricorn will have to bring us. And then it's Aquarius and we'll see where we are. Let's look at the future. Where are we going? Um, in a way, we're in kind of this murky place of the old cycle ending and we, you know, that balsamic period where it hasn't, the new has not come but we know there's a shiny new vision that we need to follow somewhere down the line. Um, that's where we are, and that's what the year is about. And, um, you know, stay safe. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's that's really key. Stay safe, everybody. Okay, so with that, I will stop there. I know that we were supposed to talk about the nodes and all of that, but I'll tell you when Michael and I get together, we could just go on for hours and hours and hours. But I think that what we did share, it is um, it certainly gives a message, right? It it and also it allows people to see just how amazing an astrologer you are because you really are one of the best that I've ever met. And I just love you so much. I can't even love you too, Nadia. Yeah, I can't even tell everybody how many times it is Michael that I go to. Like I consider Michael my personal astrologer. And when there are times when I'm having a transit and I think it's one thing and I'll contact Michael and I'll say, oh, this is happening in my chart. This is how I'm feeling. There have been so many times when Michael says, well, this is also happening in your chart and just <laughs> blown me. Oh, like, oh my God, you're right. Okay. <laughs> this is happening in my chart too. Wow. And just uh, the way in which that you encourage me to see myself differently and the love that you bring and the, and just the, the, positivity yes that mm. sense of believing in humanity believing that you can fulfill your dreams like i feel that every time i talk to you and i just love you so much thank you thank you for being here and oh my pleasure with me. truly my pleasure nadia anytime okay i love you so much michael and thank you so much for everybody to everybody for watching and until we connect again take care okay bye-bye